Okay, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, good evening. Thanks for joining everyone. Um, so my name is Jess Robinson, and I'm the Education Program Manager for the Savannah Institute. And the Savannah Institute, just in case you guys don't know, is a nonprofit organization that works in collaboration um, with farmers and scientists to develop perennial food and fodder crops with diverse, multifunctional systems grounded in ecology and inspired by the Savannah, and Savannah biome. Um, and so I'm really excited to introduce our speaker for today. Um, so Dan Shepard co-owns Shepherd Farms, which is one of the largest pecan orchards in the state of Missouri. Um, and so in his talk, Nuts and Bolts of Growing and Selling Marketable Pecans, um, Dan will discuss the tips and tricks to producing high-quality pecans. So I'm going to go ahead and switch it over. Okay. <laughs> Are we there, Jess? Yep, you're there. I can hear you. Okay. Um, well, thanks for the introduction. I have to admit, in northern Missouri, though, we call them pecans, not pecans. <laughs> I know it's going to be made for, fun for that. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in the that's south, that's they're, they're pecans. Okay, oh, Missouri. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, it's pronounced both ways, I guess. But uh, uh, anyway, up here we we like to call them pecans. This is uh, more of a of a little deal. Anyway, uh, anyway, I want to welcome y'all to Shepherd Farms. Um, just a, a little bit about us. Uh, we're um, located. At Clifton Hill, Missouri, and it's a big metropolis, about 114 people. Uh, we're about 90 miles south of the Iowa border, uh, about 100 air miles due east of Kansas City, or about 45 miles northwest of uh, Columbia, Missouri, where the University of Missouri is located. So that's kind of where we are. We're a, kind of a large farm, multifaceted. We, you know, we run uh, about a total of about 4,000 acres total on the farm. We're uh, soybeans, uh, corn, wheat, and uh, and pecans. Uh, so all that uh, kind of works together on that. I personally don't do the the corn, soybeans, and wheat. I just handle the pecans. I have a very good renter that uh, takes care of the rest of the farm and stuff for me as far as or as the row crop. I'm a little too big uh, to be a small farmer and a little too small to be a big farmer. Kind of in an odd situation there. But anyway, we're here to talk about pecans and stuff. And I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dan, and this is my lovely wife, Jan. And we've been married for about 35 years. Uh, she's my bookkeeper, and she's the store manager, head of the shipping department. And she also tells me how much money I've got in a bank account so uh, and I go so I can go out and spend it. So uh, it's it's been... Uh, uh, a fun 35 years, and hopefully we can have a 35 more years. Uh, I have one employee, uh, Justin. He spends most all his summers mowing grass, keeping the farm looking nice, and in the wintertime he spends most of his time fixing up equipment and uh, and keeping stuff cleaned up and stuff around the shop and, uh, and around our processing plant and help for the processing. So uh, he's been with me for almost two years now. He's really picked up on the grafting uh and pruning and, and orchard work, he's uh, he's really fast learning and tickled to, to have him work for us. Um, we're, main thing is we're here to talk about pecans, and that's uh, pretty well. That's about all I handle anymore. And as far as farming, part of it is is taking care of the pecan orchard and, and marketing these pecans. And uh, <clears throat> a little bit more about it, uh, we have about 200 acres in production. We have about 100 more acres of pecan trees that will be in production real soon, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about both of those. When I've got this slide up, I want to show you some. Is that You can see some open spots in this orchard. Most of those are because of uh, maybe some wrong varieties of what I've grafted stuff. Uh, we've been in the process of uh, cutting and redoing those, and we'll go into that a little bit later. But as you can see, some of these uh, spaces in the in the center here may look open. But uh, theoretically, there's still a tree that's growing there. So, uh, <clears throat> agroforestry um, came up with this fancy word a number of years ago. Um, we just called it farming between the pecan trees. Uh, my dad grew up in north central Arkansas in, in pecan country and moved up to northern Missouri in 1950 and was surprised to find pecans growing up here. And, I uh, kind of always wanted to be a farmer and a pecan farmer and end up buying 20 acres down in the river and, and uh, to put the uh, to plant some pecan trees on and 
I remember crawling up and as a kid looking over the levee and to the north here, the main farm, and I said, gee, Pop, I said, you could buy this and plant a lot of countries. He said, well, it was for sale, and we ended up buying it, I guess, about a year or two later. And the little 20 acres he ended was really one aiming to bought to plant pecans on, never got planted to pecans, but we'd put them other places else on this main farm. They say they, they we started doing this, so we uh, planted our first orchard in in 1970, an experimental orchard. Now we 1981 we planted our main orchard where we did the agroforestry sort of stuff. We just called it farming between the pecan trees back then. Um, like I said, they came up with that fancy name. We first put wheat and corn, soybeans, and, and everything else. As, while the pecan trees were growing, it worked out really nice. We can get some income off those uh, off that land while the trees were still uh, still young and, and not in production yet. So that worked out <coughs> out real well. Um, later on, some of our other orchards and stuff, we uh, seeded them down with younger ones instead of farming them. We, we, we put those to hay and also the other orchard over there into hay after the trees got too big. And we went to, and planted it to bluegrass. Uh, why bluegrass? Uh, some of the reasons were, is number one, is it's a fairly shallow rooted grass, so when it gets really dry in the summertime, the grass is not taking any moisture away from the pecan trees. Number two is it really makes a really nice mat to pick pecans up off on. And number three is is that it's uh, fairly water tolerant and can stand uh, quite a bit of wet feet and stuff where some other grasses won't. Um, and also we uh, we planted out the bluegrasses for especially hay. And believe it or not, uh, bluegrass uh, under you know, some pretty good fertilization, whatever, would produce a, a pretty decent amount of yield. But uh, it also produces extremely high quality hay, especially if it's put up early. We sell it to horse people because it doesn't have any fescue in it with the endophyte problems. Also sell it to um, uh, cattle producers for weaning calves on them. Uh, uh, when you wean a calf and put him on bluegrass hay, it seems like they do a tremendously lot better than they would on any regular grass hay and stuff. Like I say, man, we put it up early and stuff. We do have a large barn we store all this hay in, so it's baled up dry. And um, if we don't sell it all, we uh, we can store it for two, three, four, even five years and still don't lose any quality on it. Then we can catch a year like this year where it's really tough winter and stuff, and we can sell hay, you know, and, and make some pretty decent money on it. We, we can sell it for eighty to a hundred dollars a bale, and, uh, and then it, it, it pays off to hay to sell straight hay out of the field. Uh, really, it, it doesn't really pay. By the time you get your fertilizer and and any harvesting expenses, especially here in north central Missouri, because uh, a lot of people put up hay, but like I say, with the barn and stuff, we're we're pretty nice about that and, and pretty good to have it. Our, all our orchards were, were pretty well. Our new orchards we've been planting have been checked. Um, they line up every which way, and they're on 40-foot centers. The reason we put them on 40-foot centers is that's where our fertilizer buggy spent <coughs> spreads. And with us taking off a, a quite a bit of hay crop and other crops and stuff off there, uh, we depleted the soil fertility pretty fast, so we need to keep putting stuff on. Um, if we had a source of manure, we would probably put manure on as far as earlier pecan growth, but whenever we got into uh, pecan harvest and stuff, we would switch to commercial fertilizer for sure uh, to help maybe keep some of the E. coli problems and stuff down we might have since we do shake the nuts on the ground and then harvest them off the grass, so one of those things. <clears throat> but like I say, we checked them, and the reason for that is is that we could farm both ways. A lot of time when you're farming the same direction all the time, especially in Bottom ground, excuse me, it uh, tends to mess up the drainage some, so we uh, normally would do a, you know, we could farm one way and then next time spray or any other applications of mowing or spraying, we could do a different direction if we had to, so it makes that real well. Some of the other <coughs> ways we have is an intercropping system, and I think if I, I ever decide to plant uh, any more orchards, and, and every year, past year or two, I've been thinking about about planting some more trees. Uh, I'm 63 now, and another 15 years to get in production, I'll be 78 or so. And you know what? I really want to be still messing with pecans. Who knows? But uh, if I did decide to plant, I would sure definitely go with with this kind of modified cropping intercropping system. I really don't know who designed this. Whether it was the Agroforestry Center out of um, 
New Franklin, Missouri, down there, or Bill Reed, which was uh, an extension specialist for Missouri and Kansas, or who came up with it, but it's very ingenious, and, and I really like this idea. Number one thing is is it gives us a lot wider area to farm, um, 57 feet. Uh, you could definitely you know, farm 50 foot of that if you wanted to, especially when they're young. <clears throat> that makes it a lot different because our farm equipment has gotten a lot bigger over the past few years. Number two thing is it has a nice grass alley between the trees and those uh, narrow rows. That way we can get out and care for our trees, you know, do some, some weed and grass control on it, uh, uh, grafting, pruning, all that sort of stuff. And with the intercropping, it's pretty hard to get out and do a lot of that. But with those grass alleyway in between, I think it's uh, one of the nicer nicer systems I, I look at. So that's uh, if I had something to do over again, I would would probably would probably do this. And also, we got about the same number of trees out there as what we would on on 40 foot centers. Um, a lot of people say, "How do we start trees and stuff? Do we buy bare root trees or potted trees or any of that kind of stuff?" Uh, no, we do it the simple way. We want a tree, we plant a nut, and <clears throat> over the years, it's worked out great for us. Granted, we've done done a little of both or all three, bare root and and potted trees and nuts. And I guarantee, at the end of five years, uh, uh, a planted nut. Uh, Will be just as tall as any of the other trees that you know, whether it was bare root or potted. So uh, you really don't gain any speed or stuff. The only thing is maybe you know you have to graft them. The nicest thing is in this part of the country, I do not have any groundwater, well water for irrigation purposes, and I really don't have any irrigation water whatsoever here. So um, if we plant a nut, I don't care how dry it gets, uh, it'll survive with uh, with without having to do any watering. And if I had a thousand berry trees out there and had to water a thousand trees, uh, matter of fact, last summer, it would have been impossible, and I would have lost probably 95 percent of them. So if we planted a nut, uh, you know, it came along and it lived, and it it, it did okay. So one of the things to think about: these are uh, shepherd variety pecans, and we use them or conza or some other uh, decent northern variety. We definitely don't want to use a southern variety as a rootstock uh, in this far north and stuff. Uh, we get a real cold winter, and it uh, it will kill the kill the tree and kill the rootstock and stuff. Whereas what we're using here uh, works fine and pretty well about anywhere you would probably want to plant a pecan tree. Um, <clears throat> when we plant our trees, we plant them in blocks or rows, and uh, and each row's numbered or, or block's numbered and uh, with the name of what they're grafted to and also uh, uh, the variety, I mean, what's it mean, and also what row number it is. And the main reason for that is is uh, um, in harvesting, when we harvest the pecans, we can all harvest the same variety at one time. And then, if not, <clears throat> um, if if we are, then then when we clean them, you know, we're cleaning the same varieties and stuff, so the electronic sorters can pick those out easier. And then also in the processing, we can set the crackers for the one size uh, and nut of you know if it's a thicker shell pecan, and we had to mix in there some thinner shell pecans. Uh, might not crack the thick ones and smash the other ones, so it works out a lot better if we can kind of keep our our, our variety separate uh, when we do pecans in the orchard. Um, <clears throat> as you can see uh, on this tree, uh, about three feet up is where the graft is. Well, really, we've changed that tree. It was from a native nut of some kind, and uh, we've genetically modified it now to produce a you know, a superior nut that we found that we like, and we've taken uh, some twigs off and stuff. Uh, we graft uh, all our trees. Uh, that way we know what they're going to produce. If not, you know, it, if you plant a nut, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get. It could be a small nut, a big nut, a great nut, a terrible nut, whatever. When we graft them, we know exactly what they're all going to be. And uh, also um, it helps some with disease control and uh, also gets us in production uh, quite a bit sooner because we're putting mature wood on, on, on juvenile wood, and it uh, it makes them start producing nuts a, a lot sooner in life. The downfall of that is is that they're a little harder to prune and keep growing straight because they kind of want to grow every which way instead of a central leader straight up like a young tree does. Um, how we get our wood is we uh, we cut sign wood, and this um, is where we go and cut last year's growth and probably tomorrow. We will cut our signwood or start cutting on signwood for grafting purposes. 
I like to have three mornings in a row above freezing in the spring, and I think we're going to hit that uh, tomorrow. So we're going to go out and, and cut, and we'll put the sign wood in the in the coolers and uh, refrigeration until we get ready to to graft. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people want to know about grafting and stuff, and and uh, I'll play a short little video of of, of how we graft and maybe kind of explain as we go along on this, and we'll go from here. A um, little film uh, uh one of my kids shot and stuff. Here we go with a young tree, and we find a nice spot to put a grass that's straight in there. Cut it off, hand the top over to me, and while here, Greg is, is in the process of doing a, a four-flat banana graft. He's splitting the bark on four different sides, and then he'll peel that down like a banana, as he's doing now. And you have to do this when the bark will slip in the spring, late spring. Uh, we can graft mainly on up till about the 1st of June. After that, we're done, but we'll normally start around the 1st of May. Cut that off and nice and level. Put that back up so it doesn't dry. Well, he handed me the top. I go take the top, and I try to get in the box of, of sign in the cooler and find a little piece of wood that's um, the sign that's maybe just a tad bit smaller than what that end is. Uh, I find one that gets close. I'll put him to the side, look around for some others. Yep, just a little bit smaller. It's perfect. So I'll throw that away and, and keep the sign wood. Uh, cut the bottom off uh, right above the first uh, bud. And take my utility knife, which is extremely sharp, it's easy, and put about four cuts on it. That wood's a little drier, and because uh, it was cut before it was uh, the sap really started coming up in it. Hand it back to the man, he uh, puts the thing back up, and he took a, a grafting rubber, and from there we tie it on pretty tight and wrap it around. And he gets it on there, and then he loses the, the tape, which is normal. Sometimes happens, and have to re rewrap it. <clears throat> and this year I've got a little bigger and a little longer one, so a little easier to work with. But uh, uh, got that on nice and straight, pounded down where it's good and tight on there. While he's uh, doing all that, I'm tearing uh, some aluminum foil off, and he wraps that around to help keep it cool. And then I have some uh, masking tape to staple it to keep the moisture in on on that graft side, and also keep the uh, tin foil from blowing off. And then on top of that, we dab some Elmer's wood glue or Elmer's regular glue on top to keep the uh, moisture in. And that's uh, the grafting we do, and it's uh, pretty simple. Um, we what I call team graft. Normally, two of us do it together. Number one is that we can do oh, about 12, 14 trees per hour, and depending on how far apart we have to go. But it, it goes a lot faster than out there by yourself all day long grafting, and two of us, we can talk and carry on, and, and it uh, it makes the day go a lot faster, and, and really there's no downtime and stuff. Uh, this is a picture of a, of a tree that is um, was cut off and it grew uh, one year up, and then... Uh, second year uh, in spring it was grafted, and uh, in one year growth we got about three foot of growth, four foot of growth on it. So um, we cut a tree off and, and what we call a stump graft on that thing. Uh, you know, in a couple, three years it's uh, the tree's already seven feet tall. The <coughs> um, you know, cut tree. And you can see this tree here also is where it uh, was come off. And what this was is where we had some, some mix-up in varieties that we thought were really good, and they tended not to be as good as we thought. Uh, they had maybe terrible scab problems or other problems that uh, didn't work out, uh, and instead of keep uh, spraying them and fertilizing them and pruning them and all that and never getting any nuts off of them, after five or six or eight years, we decided to cut them off. What we will do is we will cut those off um, at right to ground level or let a sprout come up, and then we would... Um, uh, regraft that, and within uh, normally about five years, we'll start getting production off that tree instead of waiting for 15 or 20 years if we'd have planted a nut. So it works out a lot better. We put white paint on where the graft is, so when we come along, we know where that graft is in case, uh, you know, whenever we start to <coughs> prune it or whatever, 
or I'm going to come down and real graft it. This is about as big we'll stop painting them from now on. Um, <clears throat> you can see this uh, tree here. It's a regrafted tree. I guess it was probably uh, grafted about you know, seven years ago and to a Pawnee variety. I would say um, it seemed like to me that tree probably produced about maybe at least 100 pounds, maybe 150 pounds of nuts this past year. And at $3 a pound, you know, we got three, $400 worth of nuts off that one tree. So it really paid off to regraft them and wait the time. Um, sometimes, you know, it's a little different. Sometimes we'll lose a few of those off those uh, regraft deals. They will, you know, get a big win because they haven't formed completely around the root. They, they will blow over sometimes. But normally if we only lose about 10% to blow out, so it's way worth the the, the deal to, to handle that. Um it's not really that big a deal. Um, really what we look for, though, is to, you know, is this uh, nice variety of pecans that come off. Uh, they're ready to shake. The uh, They've dried up real, and, uh, you know, they're starting to open up. And just uh, getting ready for harvest, this is what we're looking for at the end of the season every year. Some people want to know what kind of varieties we graft, um, that we have grafted in our orchard. Uh, right now we have a lot of Pawnees. That's a really nice nut. It's it's almost a paper shell from the south, but it uh, it grows 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 well up here. Uh, it will mature. Uh, some of the bad things about it is really got a really too soft a shell. Um, in harvesting and and stuff, it tends to crack and break a lot worse than all the others. Kind of a job to pull off because we have a broken shell. We can't store them so. That has to come off. The uh, nice thing about it is that we can sell those as hand crackers, and we sell those for $3 a pound. Uh, whether you want 1,000 pounds or 5 pounds, doesn't make much difference. It's still $3 a pound. It does get some scab, but I hear I don't have a trouble with scab on that variety here on the farm. Our next one we grafted quite a bit of is, is Kanza. came out of Chautauqua, Kansas, down there. It's half uh, major pecan, which is a round one. So it makes a pretty round nut. Uh, it's one of the best. It has a great flavor. It shells super easy. Um, it has no scab problems whatsoever. But I have had a little cold damage, especially on some really fast-growing uh, uh, trees uh, of, the, of the Kanza. Um, I'm still happy with it. Uh, we'll still be grafting some, definitely finishing some orchards and stuff up with those. Another one we grabbed quite a bit of is the Shepherd. Um, that was named after uh, after us, I guess. Uh, my dad bought a tree over uh, by Brunswick, Missouri, in the Dalton Bottoms uh, a number of years ago to get sign wood off of it. It was really a nice nut. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we were sitting around thinking what we was going to call it. And I said, well, Dad, I said, you own it or we own it. We might as well just call it the Shepherd. So we do. And uh, it's turned out real well for us. It, uh, it's won quite a few nut shows over the years and stuff. It Shells out well percentage-wise. It has a really beautiful-looking nut. It's oblong shape. It works in the crackers real well. Nice thing about it is it doesn't get scab, which is a fungal disease, and it's it's very very cold hardy. So if anybody you know, definitely no problem grafting. As far as I know, uh, you know even farther north than here, it, it works out real well. It's not a huge nut. It's about a size 12 or 13, and it's not a it's not as big as a as a Pawnee or some of the others. But it uh, it is a really nice size, not a lot bigger than the native stuff. We got quite a few witties grafted. Uh, witties uh, is a really ugly nut meat. When you crack it open, it doesn't look very pretty. It tastes really good, but uh, not the most prettiest nut in the way. Um, it's uh, it's cold hardy. Comes out of Iowa, and uh, it does get some scab, but uh, not a tremendous amount. But it is a good producer of uh, about every year, and, and has a pretty good crop. So it. Uh, it helps fill in the deal. The Niblix, uh, my mother's favorite. Uh, it shells extremely well. Uh, it cracks open into some beautiful, really light-colored halves. And uh, not really heavy producer. And the problem with it is it seems like the stink bugs really, really love it. And we have quite a bit of problem now with stink bugs, and, and that was one variety seemed like they really work on a lot. We have quite a bit of Colby grafted. It's uh, one of the earliest nuts we harvest. It is terribly bad on scab, though, and it has a really hard shell. And it's a fairly nice sized nut, and it's a good producer, but but the scab problem is a little different. The Mullahay, if I'm, excuse me, the Nimbleck comes out of Indiana. The Mullahay comes out of Iowa. It's cold hardy, and it has some scab, and it's just about an average producer. 
and we have some prook and some prook seedlings and uh, the bad thing about it is it's really scabby and a very thin shell and it's fairly small so the birds just love it um, you know percentage wise it shells out well and everything else it looks good people really like it it's got a great flavor and so the birds and the, and the insects and stuff and uh, other animals so we uh, we take pretty well note of that some of the other stuff uh, problems we have is stuff that everything loves a pecan uh, the past couple of years we've been hit really bad by the Japanese beetles. Um, I really hate spraying, but uh, those things can de- can take a, a bunch of leaves off, especially off the younger pecan trees and the young grafted trees. So we keep a pretty close eye on there, and it seems like all they want to do is breed all the time, and that's about what they're doing over there. All I don't know. Um, like I say, everything loves pecans. We have trouble with walnut caterpillars also, and tent caterpillars and that sort of thing, just like anything else. What we found out is, you know, if you've got one pecan tree out there, you don't really have a whole lot of problems. But when you get thousands of them put together, then you have some other problems and stuff, and and it kind of feeds on itself and ends and stuff. These are walnut caterpillars in their last stage and stuff. They can pretty well take every leaf off a pretty good-sized tree in in just almost overnight. They're ferocious eaters once they get to this, this final stage of the white hair. So uh, they're fairly easy to control, but uh, there's something you sure need to watch out for because when a tree loses its leaf, it's got to leaf back out, and from there on, it, uh, you know, net yields and stuff slow down. Uh, we talked a little bit about scab. I talked to them about varieties and stuff. Scab's a fungus that gets on the nuts, and it's hard to say that these nuts uh, here is a fairly bad scab infection. They probably won't fill out on the inside, especially the smaller ones. Uh, they'll be empties. And maybe these bigger ones, they may fill out some, but uh, pretty sure the husk will not split open on those whatsoever. So um, those are set where they will not, you know, will not open up. And so we we have to do a a spray on those, a a fungal spray at least a couple of times a year probably. Um, Like I say, uh, spraying, uh, sprayers are expensive. Sprayers cost money. It costs money to spray. Um, I really hate doing it. I do it all myself. Um, we do most of it at night, so uh, really makes uh, makes it for a long day and a long night, especially when me working all night. I'm not a teenager or young in my twenties anymore. Could stay up all night, but uh, I still get it done and this, that, and the other. I wish I didn't have to do it, but if I didn't, uh, definitely spray for some scab or some other stuff. Uh, I really can't afford to lose half my crop at least uh, and go that way. Um, we've tried some of the other uh, alternatives of, uh, of, of non-chemical control. They really haven't worked very well for us, so we um, tend to go with uh, with the regular insecticides and, and, and fungicides to help hold these uh, these insects and stuff down. Um, some more of the problems and stuff we have. Uh, I'm kind of lucky I don't have quite as much trouble with squirrels as other people do. Um, I do sell a lot of nuts to people with pet squirrels, though, so that's kind of one of the nice things. Um, some of the other problems we have is deer is the um, a crow. Uh, if you notice, the crow's got a, a pecan in his mouth, and he uh, uh, they're, uh, they're thieving boogers. They'll uh, pick a pecan up and eat it there or peck on it and halfway eat on it, which is no good. We harvest, we got to pull them out. Or he'll fly off with it, and he'll drop it, and he'll come back and get another one, whatever. Uh, I do have a gentleman that loves to uh, hunt crows, and uh, uh, he educates them pretty well, so it's, it stopped a lot of our loss. But at one time, we were losing better than 1,000 pounds of pecans a day to our crows. And, you know, at uh, $2, $3 a pound, that adds up pretty fast. Uh, in a couple weeks' time, they can they can really do a lot of damage to us. So anyway, that's uh, just part of what we have to do. Um as you're coming along by the farm, you'll notice uh, quite a bit of pecan trees. Our orchards, and most of them are right on a U.S. highway. We have great highway frontage. Uh, we keep the highway right-of-ways mowed. We have trees along the right-of-way that uh, kind of lets people know they're getting close to us and stuff. And then uh, uh, no source close, and we have a large sign on the highway. And if you can miss that sign, you probably shouldn't be driving stuff. Just uh, you know, telling everybody we're a half mile down the gravel road. Uh, you know, and we used to do a lot of advertising and word of mouth, radio, whatever. We do some Facebook, uh, internet's kind of becoming a huge part of it. 
Um, I show some cars, take some pecans there, give some free samples away, and it's really improved our sales and stuff. <clears throat> so that's some of the stuff we do. And like I say, that large sign on the highway directs everybody down to our farm store. And this is our farm store and office set up. Um, you can tell um, we're open three months out of the year, October, November, December. We used to be open year-round. We had uh, um, American buys and stuff, and we sold meat year-round and stuff. And But now since we're out of that business and just strictly pecans, we're open three months out of the year. Uh, the main thing is to keep the, you know, your place neat and clean looking, uh, you know, the, the, the walk swept off, uh, have some nice looking flowers, keep the yard mowed. And the same with the orchard, you know, you keep your orchard if you look professional and like you have a lot of pride in your, your business or your farm. It, uh, it seemed to, to, to really, uh, uh, really improve the sales and stuff. People like to see successful places, I think, and, and they like to, uh, you know, if it's clean and nice, it, it really makes a, a difference on some of our sales. Inside our store, we we sell other things besides just pecans. We'll sell cashews and mixed nuts and chocolate-covered stuff and cinnamon pecans and that sort of thing, plus a line of jams and jellies and stuff. We have a private label put on for us that has our name and stuff on it and uh, a lot of sugar-free jams and stuff and become a fairly big seller for us also, so we... We do that. Um, we keep our pecans in a cooler, uh, and we crack them and stuff. We bring them in and put them in a the cooler, keep them cool. A couple of reasons for that. We used to do it when we had them in paper bags, to keep the oil from coming through the bags so bad. Uh, but anyway, now we've gone all to plastic with some air holes and stuff in them. That way everybody can see what they're buying, and people really like that, especially on the blown ones where they've been... Uh, cracked and some of the shells been blown out it keeps a lot of pressure keeps them a lot lighter colored if you let them sit out for a while you know they, they tend to get a little dark fairly fast we sell them in in one pounders uh, jars two pound jars or three pound bags of the shelled ones and three pound bags of the blown ones and also we keep we sell black walnuts and stuff in one pound jars and stuff and like i say we put a new cooler in it's working really well for us this past year and been well received and people can see exactly what they're buying and getting around a lot better. Um, we also in our store we we do the cracking and processing in the back. I have a big picture window there where people can stand and see how we're we're doing, how we're working, how the machines work and stuff. It's kind of amazing. Uh, by the end of the day, there's shells and dust flying everywhere back there. And but uh, after we get done cracking, it's uh, you know. Everybody, you know, we pitch in and clean up real well and sweep up every night. And where it looks out beautiful, normally we crack about two days a week. And uh, rest time, people can see what we're doing, where we work back there. It's nice and clean, which uh, people really impress that. They said they like to see where their their pecans are being being processed and know it's clean back there. So we don't have too much of a, you know, I mean, people just, they know what we're doing. We don't try to hide anything at all. Um, here's uh, pecans after they've been washed and sanitized uh, on the drying tables. They'll set it out here for a day, maybe two at max, and uh, be ready to be be worked up and gone through the the system. And uh, when we're blowing the stuff, uh, we uh, hire about three or four. Normally, uh, young ladies, a lot of them are single moms or young moms and stuff, and they got kids in school, and we work around that pretty well. They can come in and. 8 o'clock in the morning, and pretty much get them out by 3. Uh, some of them can stay over maybe and, and help clean up afterwards. We try and be done cracking by 3 in the afternoon, and then uh, the help that doesn't have kids can, can stay around and clean up and, and get everything wiped down and ready to go for the, the next time we do. Uh, we'll normally do about 5,000 pounds of, of in-shell nuts a day when we process uh, and uh, I pay them. I pay my help pretty well there. Those those gals, so they uh, they show up and and are ready to work whenever whenever we need them. Like I say, we normally work about two, maybe three days a week in there, and then later on in the year we'll do some showing pecans and stuff. <clears throat> a lot of the pecans and the problem with pecans and stuff we sell is that people want pecans the first of October. Pecans really don't start falling until around the first of November. We'll start sometime harvesting around the 20th of October, but the uh, time we get them dried and cleaned and everything else, it's normally the first of October before we can get those on the market. So we do. We have on-farm storage. I have a large freezer we can drive a forklift in. Each one of those white bins you see there on the left uh, hold about 1,000 pounds of pecans. 
Uh, normally we put about forty, fifty thousand pounds in there. I can hold up almost seventy-five thousand pounds if we stack it clear full. Uh, the boxes and stuff is what we store our pecans in. These are ones pretty well we have shelled out, and strictly for nut meats, whether they be in canisters or or uh, three-pound bags and stuff. And you can see, uh, you know, we have our own boxes uh, printed, so we can mark on exactly what's in the box, whether they're shelled pecans or blown, and how many's in there, and, and the net weight and stuff, and our name and telephone number on the boxes. And most everything we do out there is for commercial stuff to, to other wholesalers to. Grocery stores, bulk food stores, that sort of stuff is in these boxes, and and uh, so everybody knows what's in them and where they come from, and it's a nice new box. So uh, it works out <clears throat> real well. We keep all these um, at zero degrees. We'll start filling the, the freezer normally about the middle of December, definitely by the first of the year. Uh, they're out, the becomes stored out another building without any heat and stuff out there, so as they're cleaned and dried and put in the bins, we get ready, we'll start stacking them in the freezer like I say, keep them at zero in there. They're farm fresh. It's can be really uh, got people now that really rather have the last year because they they're seasoned. And they don't have that green taste to them, but it works out uh, out well for us on that sort of deal. Some of the other things we used to sell and stuff we don't do anymore. But uh, when we had a store year round with the buffalo stuff, we raised sweet corn. Um, have sweet corn about four or five times a year <clears throat> a day. You know, days is strictly um, sell it at fairly reasonable. And we'd sell, you know, forty, fifty thousand ears a day when we had our sweet corn. We had people come from Iowa and Illinois to buy corn from us. Um, instead of paying three dollars a dozen for it, we'd sell them for a dollar and a half, and make it up on volume. And that uh, they got a lot of people out to buy sweet corn. And and while they were there, they would uh, pick up some pecans or buffalo meat or peaches. We'd get peaches shipped in from the Boot Hill, and those Boot Hill peaches were really nice peaches. They um, uh, got the number ones, uh, two and a half and up, a nice size one without any blimps and stuff. And people know they could always come out and get great peaches from us, and uh, and those were pretty good money makers also, and especially because they had the cooler space for them from the pecans. We had the cooler space that we could use also for the peaches. The main thing is, like I say, is to get people out to your store. You know, I'm um, the closest town, big town, or larger city is about 15,000 people. It's Mobley, and it's... Uh, about 12, 14 miles away, so maybe get those people out or Columbia, wherever. Also, the nicer thing is <clears throat> that I'm pretty well the, the first pecan orchard in the eastern part of Missouri, so we get people coming from Illinois. We're pretty well the first store they can stop at. And about the first one on the, on the north, see, for all the body people coming down from Iowa and stuff to do that. So, anyways, this thing to get people to come out to store. Uh, we used to raise some pumpkins, too, and we'll probably maybe start back in that again. Um, one thing about pumpkins is is when you have <clears throat> a good year for pumpkins, everybody raises pumpkins and you can't sell one. Uh, when uh, you don't have a very good year, you can't hardly raise any pumpkins, and then you don't have any pumpkins to sell. So I raised some pumpkins one year and I said, why don't I just give them away? The problem with it was where we raised the pumpkins, it's not a very accessible place for people to go down and pick their own. So we'd pick them and bring them up to the store. And uh, from there, we would, uh, <clears throat> you know, I would advertise everybody comes to the farm gets a free pumpkin. So if Grandma comes out with the four grandkids, they take home five pumpkins and, and tickles could be and feel kind of bad about it. And they come in and buy a bag of pecans or some buffalo meat back then or whatever. And I made more money by giving pumpkins away than I ever could by selling one of the dang things. Uh, a little work to them, but uh, hey, it uh, it all works out good. And and that worked good in agroforestry, especially on some young trees and stuff, where you could go down there and raise some pumpkins between the, between that. Um, you know, <clears throat> a few few little thoughts about this. Uh, um, some of the chemicals in farming and stuff anymore has gotten where Roundup is really not very good around pecan trees. It uh, it'll tend to to set them back some, especially on the young trees. And some of the Liberty Link is the same way. <clears throat> It'll knock the leaves off of them. Um, some of the other stuff is we have is what? Um, dicamba has come back as a big soybean producer. I feel if anything's going to get me out of the pecan business, it will probably be dicamba as a neighbor sprays or something, and then it'll uh, it'll uh, migrate over to, <clears throat> to me, excuse me, in the middle of the night or whatever. That's probably one of the oldest things that scares me the most. Um, another thing is is that um, 
my father always said is that only old men plant trees. And I tell you, I think he was pretty right on that because in a way, but then in a way he was wrong because when I was a young man, I planted an awful lot of trees. But I did have an old man out there always making me plant the dang things. And as I look back, I'm sure I'm glad he uh, he made me plant these trees. These trees here are almost 50 years old that, uh, that the young man is standing by now and, and uh, in our experimental orchard and stuff. But uh, that uh, that's... Uh, Pretty well my talk for the uh, evening. If uh, anybody has any slides or has any questions and stuff about the slides I presented, it'd be fine, Jess. We'll, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Sweet. Thank you, Dan. That talk was amazing and super interesting, especially you describing the grafting process. I, I hadn't seen it like that before, so that was really cool. Um, so, yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, go ahead and drop it in the chat box. And I'm also um, going to go ahead and open up the, um, the question queue. And so anyone who wants to just speak it into the mic can, can do that as well. So let me go ahead and do that. Uh, all right, and I'll just give some people some time to think about any questions they have. And um, if not, I have a couple questions. Okay, we have a question from um, Josiah. So he's asking, give me a second, um, why did you get into buffalo and what was your favorite grazing animal for the orchard? <clears throat> Found out that they were good to eat. And <clears throat> so we got in the buffalo business. We were in the business for about 40 two years and um, enjoyed it. At one time we had over 900 head of, of bison running on the farm. The thing about it is that we never ran them in the orchards. Um, one of the reasons on the small trees is cattle or, or anything else, you had to fence them off of the orchards. Number two thing is is that you really, in a big orchard, you needed to fence them because if not, they would congregate around the water or certain areas that wouldn't graze others. And number three thing is is that uh, whenever uh, in orchards get big enough and we get a wetty a wet spring like this that they could pock the ground pretty bad uh, and hard to pick up the nuts and stuff. Also, cattle manure or any manure, <coughs> especially cattle manure, grass manure, on pecans is almost impossible to get off. So we do not graze our orchards. Um, I know some people do, but. For me, with <clears throat> retailing them, all that kind of stuff, I, uh, I, I just, I just don't do that. So. All right. Any other questions? Got, got another one um, from Nelson. Would there be any other trees you would plant as a companion species with pecan or pecan? I bet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, <clears throat> it's a monoculture. Um, we did have some other varieties. My, my dad, we had some. We planted quite a few black walnuts in our orchard, um, and where we had some tree skips and stuff. My dad loved black walnuts, and I do too. I really like them. My wife hates them, but I really like them. And and they they were all grafted, and everything worked out great. But the problem is, is when you go to take care of pecan trees, you got the black walnuts in the way, and they were really hard to separate out, especially. In the size that we were we were doing it with machine, <clears throat> and when you're picking up pecans, you'd always pick up a black walnut. Now we cut these black walnuts out probably 15 years ago, and I'm still every once in a while picking a black walnut up, still left over from all those years. Um, just didn't work very well. It was a completely different spray schedule for them compared to what it would be for a pecan. My dad also grew up uh, eating hickory nuts. So he loved what they call a hickon, which is a native natural cross between a hickory and a pecan. And that uh, that's really fine. If you grew up eating hickory nuts, you love them. If you don't, you know, you, you never did. You, you really don't care that much for them. The same way with them, um, a whole completely different schedule on harvesting, a whole completely different schedule on, on spraying and stuff because they had a tremendous... Uh, weevil problem where, where the you know most of the nuts would not be good if you didn't hit the spray just right on those and uh, really didn't have a lot of sales because 
Most of the people who grew up hickory eating hickory nuts are no longer with us anymore. So that market kind of went out, so we cut most of those down. I think I have a couple of trees left, but we probably had five or 600 of them at one time. But we cut them out and, and regrafted them to pecans, and like I showed you there, that are now producing pecans and stuff. I um, understand where you're coming from, um, but in our situation, it just worked better just to stick with a with a monoculture as far as uh, trees and not have any other companion trees in there. We took all the rest of them out. All right, so we have another question um, from Josiah again. So, what size of um, what size of orchard is non-chemical pest control no, no longer feasible? Oh, uh, non-chemical pest control. That's hard to say. I mean, I'm fairly big, and so it uh, it's there. It depends on your situation. I'd be scared to, to answer that. Like I say, if you got one or two pecan trees out there, you could probably do it, or you know, maybe ten or fifteen. But you get much more than that. You know, you're going to start ending up with some insect load, pretty heavy load, and stuff, and kind of hard to take care of them. And then uh, I don't know. It's it's you know we've tried it, you know, a little bit of it, and and it never really worked. You know, in a few orchards for us that we tried it in. So. Um, Kind of the wrong one to ask that question. Question two. Uh, I wish I had a better answer for him, but uh, um, to be profitable, and I'll be true. He said, you know, the name of the game is 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 to make a profit out here. Um, I like paying taxes, and if I'm paying taxes, that means I'm making money, and my pecan trees are doing well. So, and then that gives me something that I can go in and and, and improve and add to the farm and add more land or, or more equipment or more machinery or whatever. So uh, the main thing is, you know, is, is for us was to to maximize the, maximize the profit and maximize yield on these pecan trees at a reasonable cost. All right. Sweet. Thanks. Um, and then I just I realized for those on the phone, um, if you want to ask a question for the, like, the voice Q&A, just press star six. Um, and we have another question from the chat box from um, Nelson, and he's wondering if um, incorporating poultry into the orchard would help with insect control. Another similar question. Um, some it would, especially like on pecan weevil uh, that come up out of the ground and, and, and then climb up the tree and then uh, find a nut and drill a hole in and lay their eggs, which uh, gives a, uh, the hole, the pecan comes off with a hole in on the ground or has a worm in it. When it's processed, so that's pretty thing. Um, a lot of the other things like the walnut caterpillars and stuff, it wouldn't do a bit of good, I don't think. Um, in my situation, I don't think I could have enough chickens out there to 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 really do you know uh, do that sort of thing. And uh, you know, to, uh, when the June bugs, uh, the Japanese beetles come out, you know, you could have your whole orchard full of chickens, you know, small. May do some one, but when they come out of there by the millions, I don't see how they could keep up with it. Um, but it'd be an interesting thing. Yeah, on, on a small situation, I could see uh, see uh, see poultry is, is working quite a bit to help hold some of the insect problems down. You're still going to have the scab problems if unless you graft it to uh, non-scab varieties. And then someone who's to say that maybe in 10 years, I know some varieties we used to graft uh, that weren't scabby at all, and now. Now I tend to get scab real well, you know, uh, fairly bad. So uh, maybe some different funguses come along and, and stuff that causes that problem. But yeah, I think on a small orchard or small situation, uh, uh, poultry would work. All right, great. Um, okay, it looks like we don't have any questions from anyone else. I actually had a question. Um, just thinking about the age to it takes for a the country start producing nuts and um, and then like at what age are they slowing down in production and you're thinking about phasing them out or, or, or you know starting some new, some new trees to replace it okay you, you want to know when they would start in production is yeah. what you're saying yeah. um, I say if we plant a nut we'll start getting maybe and graft him in, on some good ground and with good, you know, weed control around the base of trees where they're not, weeds are not, you know, in, in competition with the trees. And uh, he's grafting to a, a pretty precocious pecan that will start producing at a fairly early age after grafting. We can start getting a few nuts at 10 to 12 years of age. We can get some harvestable production generally at, 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 
at 20, you know, 20 years in full production, definitely about 25 years without any problem. So 15 to 20 years, we can start getting some production off of them, you know, harvestable at 20 and full production at 25. I figure a country will last 100 years, um, and uh, and that uh, uh, that way they'll uh, they'll outlive me or or uh, keep producing within. The main thing uh, to keep uh, orchard and trees in production is to thin trees out. And probably one of the hardest things to do is to go and and decide what tree has to come out and and cut them down. Uh, right now, that tree that that young man has has got his hands on is probably slated to come out because there's a tree in between them there and they're getting close. We just don't ever want a pecan tree to touch another pecan tree. And uh, uh, we figured the trees we planted, by the time it comes to mature orchard, there won't be one-sixteenth of the pecan trees left in the orchard from when we first planted it. So we'll take that many of them out over the years. So uh, keep them thinned out, and, you know, that'll keep them producing for, for years and years and years. I've seen native pecan trees that are probably six foot in diameter, and uh, they still produce pecans every year. Mm, wow. Yeah, that's crazy. I didn't realize it's 100 years. It's, that's really amazing. It's a great thing to pass yeah. on um, to your children and children's children. Yeah. You know, it's not like an apple tree that, you know, sometimes, you know, 6, 8, 15 years, you know, they're, you know, pull them out and replant them. But uh, um, pecan trees, it's uh, being a hardwood, it's a, it's a long-term deal. And, and that's the thing about it is, you know, the pecan business is not a sh- short turnaround, you know, just, uh, you know, you're in it for the long haul. And, uh it's been good to us. I can't complain. It's it's uh, pecan business has been good. And the nice thing about retailing too is that when we retail them out, we uh, you know I've got a thousand small customers instead of one or two big customers. So I'm selling to a sheller. Some years I'd make more money selling pecans to a sheller that would uh, you know maybe in Texas or you know whoever Arizona wherever they are, and uh, you know sell them to go to the commercial bakeries and that sort of thing. But uh, some years are, you know, maybe a huge crop in Texas and Georgia and every place else, and the price of pecans falls down, and, you know, maybe they don't want to come up here and buy pecans, or if they want to pay any much for them. Some years there's a shortage, and, man, they, they really want to pay a lot of money for your pecans. Mm-hmm. I like to have a nice, you know, pecan crop here, uh, you know, year-round. I mean, every year, and I can sell locally to the local people, and they like it because they know where their pecans are coming from. And they're getting a good quality product, which, uh, you know, if, if I wouldn't eat it, I'm definitely not going to sell it. And and that's, I think, some people make the mistake by, by doing that is selling some pecans that they probably, you know, shouldn't be selling or, you know, for retail business and stuff. And, and it hurts them in the long run. And, you know, you can <clears throat> make 20 people happy not tell, and they won't tell but one person. But you make one person unhappy and they'll tell, you know, 20 people how bad they were. So... Uh, you know, it's a high-quality product we send out of here. If it's not, you know, we, we pitch it. it. It goes out the door. We don't, uh, you know, we don't try to hide them. Yeah. Quality's where it's at, especially in our situation where we're selling to the public. And uh, like I say, I like to have a lot of small customers and instead of, a, you know, one or two big ones. So it works out better for us and better for the customers. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, definitely. Are there any more questions? All right, I guess. Um, I I actually have one more question, and then if no one has any questions, we can call it a night. Um, But I don't know if I missed this. With the different varieties you're growing, um, when you're harvesting those, do you just, like, mix them and and, and sell them all as, like, you know, a bag of pecans, or or are you selling the different varieties as, like, separate products? Uh, Normally on the the blown pecans where we're selling, you know, a nice mix. We'll put maybe you know, like three different varieties in. You know, each cracker is running different. You know, two crackers run one variety. Another set of crackers, two crackers run another variety. They want to have another variety. You know, in one cracker, and that gives a nice mix of of everything. Um, you know, like we might run some of the uh, witties in there on one cracker that you know maybe not the prettiest, not the world. They taste great. You put a whole bag of those out. They don't look very good, but you kind of mix a few in. You know, and it it works out well. And uh, and people go ahead and like them. Um, as far as the show ones, those show ones normally come out as all the same variety in the bag is what we're showing because 
uh, you know, we keep them, we keep all our varieties separate when we shell them that way because to go through the equipment and, and, the, and the blowers and all that and, and sorters, it, it it works best to have the one size pecan, one size nut meats instead of a whole bunch of different sizes mixed together. So, on our shelled out ones, completely no shells. They're they're separate varieties, and then the uh, the blown ones are normally a mix of at least three varieties. And also, this one orchard here is a mix of a whole bunch of trees. We don't keep them separate. We harvest them as one, and we have a size that sizes the nuts out, and we crack them and and uh, sell them as blown because as a, as a mixed bag, and works out pretty well for us. Okay, sweet. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, and it looks like we don't have any more questions, but um, yeah, just thank you for your time and this talk, and it's just really cool to get to the nitty-gritty of pecans, and especially now I know um, <laughs> how to pronounce it, at least uh, in Missouri. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> and everyone else is saying thank you in the chat box. It was a really great talk. Um, and so, yeah, everyone have a wonderful night, and thank you for your time and energy and questions. Okay, sounds fine. Thank you.